Well, good afternoon, and welcome to our guest speakers, our other visitors, students, faculty, and staff. We're here a week after Pope Francis's historic address to a joint session of Congress to share reflections on his speech and their implications for us and for our world. As many of you know, Congressman Jim McGovern gave me his one gallery ticket for this event. It was an extraordinary privilege, and I'm grateful to Jim for this opportunity. I've come to know him over the last four years, and especially after our trip to El Salvador last November, which was the 25th anniversary of the killing of the Jesuits and the two women at the University of Central America. Five years previously, I had gone to this, a similar reunion with Georgetown University, and Jim and many others from the Worcester area were there as well. I estimate that when I was sitting in the gallery and looking down, there were approximately 1,200 to 1,500 people in the house for a speech. It was every fire marshal's nightmare. <laughs> it was so intensely crowded, there were 435 members of Congress, as you know, and six non-voting representatives of the house. There were 50 senators, at least 50 special guests, and many staffers, reporters, and then on top of that, the whole gallery all the way around was completely filled and there were a lot of people standing in every little corner down on the floor. When the Pope entered at 10 a.m., he was announced as the Pope of the Holy See, because as a head of state, that's the formula they use, the Queen of England, the President of Yugoslavia, the Pope of the Holy See, and it's not language that we were familiar with, so people kind of perked up. It's the former protocol language. Pope Francis is the first religious leader ever to address a joint session of Congress, but about the hundredth head of state to do so. As he walked to the dais, the crowd stood and cheered loudly. And given the current climate of American political life, it was an interesting contrast between the rambunctious and often antagonistic politicians and the quiet humility and simplicity of the Pope himself. Now, while I admire the Pope for addressing us in English and his sensitivity to his audience, it is not a language, as you know, that he is comfortable in, and I have to admit that inside the chamber itself, it was very hard to understand him. The microphone, his accent, the constant clicking of cameras in the photojournalist section of the gallery itself, which ran through the whole uh, address, made it very hard to hear him. While the press and a few ecclesiastical visitors had an advanced copy of the text in front of them, the rest of us did not, and I watched people straining to hear and understand what was being delivered. I think those of you who watched on television actually had much better sound and a better ability, and sometimes even an attempt at, at live streaming the text underneath. Therefore, because I couldn't understand everything, it was striking just to watch him and his audience interact. You know, if you, if you look down at, at, the, at the chamber itself, so above Vice President Biner and Speaker Boehner, above their head in marble is etched the words, in God we trust. And as I looked down at those words from my vantage point and then looked at the Pope addressing this audience, it took on a different kind of meaning and significance because the Pope himself so clearly emphasized the presence of God in his life and in the world. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a kind of a poignant reminder of our history and what that, that language means for us and for this country. It was also very fascinating to watch who stood and applauded and when <laughs> and who didn't. Jim McGovern told me in his office later that the members of Congress had been told that this was not a State of the Union address and they should not react as if it were. But they did stand and applaud along party lines, depending on the topic being mentioned. Frankly, the Pope himself was constantly encouraging dialogue on human and ethical issues and not specific political strategies. And I must say, I found it a little sad that the politicians couldn't react simply as concerned human beings and citizens rather than as politicians with distinct agendas. I was also struck, and I don't want to steal anyone else's thunder, by his simple remark that politics is an expression of our compelling need to live as one, when clearly there is so much political division and antagonism at this moment in political life. Politics is clearly a, a, an expression of our compelling need to live as one, and that was why we were gathered in, in Congress, and, and, and I thought he was a wonderful reminder of our politicians' vocations. 
Now, while I notice that I know that our speakers are going to emphasize specific points in his, in his content, I would like to say as someone whose research area has been the intersection of American Christian spirituality and social change, it was fascinating to me and I think to the audience to hear the Pope mention Abraham Lincoln, who really didn't identify with any Christian denomination specifically, but with Christian values, with Martin Luther King, a Baptist, and Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton, both converts to Catholicism. And while President Lincoln and Dr. Martin Luther King were known to everyone in the audience, it became very clear quickly that there was some puzzlement when he described Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day, who were known to some, but to many not. And I watched faces like, who is that? It on the floor as the house was listening. Now, when the talk ended, the Pope left to meet crowds from the, on, from the house balcony. And I think if you watching TV saw him come out on the balcony and speak. And Jamie Hogue, who was not able to get into the gallery, was actually sitting on the platform there, who's our director of federal and community relations. We in the gallery, however, were held in place until the Pope was finished outside. I assume because the get balcony is off the gallery level and they didn't want us walking behind him for security reasons. I then made my way to Congressman McGovern's office where his staff quickly provided me with the text of the Pope's address so that he and I could read it over very quickly before we were then interviewed by the press in conversation because the text, the talk that I heard, probably a third of, was quite different from the talk that you heard on the TV and, and I was so impressed to see it laid out in such a way. And finally, um, as an American Catholic and a Jesuit, and as of three weeks ago, a new American citizen who now holds dual citizenship with Canada, I was both proud and humbled and amazed that I was sitting in the United States House to hear Pope Francis address the joint session of Congress and our nation. And with that, those are my brief welcome and reflections. I'm gonna introduce Mary Beth to come up and introduce our panel. Good afternoon, everyone. When we first learned about the speech, we really knew it would be important that this be unpacked. And I think after last week's enthusiasm and joy that um, we all experienced in having Pope Francis among us, uh, it feels to me even more th important that we unpack it because I would hate for this event to go uh, get caught up only in the emotional uh, and joy that he did bring and that is really authentic. But to miss his call to conversion and call an invitation to dialogue and change that was pretty clear in his address. So I'm really happy this afternoon to have the chance to unpack it a little bit and to think a little bit about what challenges are before us um, with our guests. So we're really happy to have Marjorie Egan, the Crux Spirituality Columnist from WGBH, uh, radio host as well. And on our panel, Reverend David Dayan Reinick from the Boundless Way uh, Temple here in Worcester. Uh, Mr. Frank Carthizer from Worcester Interfaith. He is the uh, lead organizer there. Um, we also have with us Professor Janair Dali of the Religious Studies Department, Professor Sarah Mitchell from the uh, ge a geologist from the Biology Department and Director of Environmental mm -hmm. Studies, and Professor Dan Klingard from Political Science, and Emily Muldoon of the class of 2016. So I won't uh, keep you any longer, just let's get to their conversation. So thank you for being here, all of you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. As I was mentioning before, uh, Holy Cross is gorgeous, didn't look so gorgeous when I was an undergraduate like 40 years ago, but it is spectacular and I'm thrilled to be here today and thrilled to be uh, on this panel. You know, I wrote um, in, in Crux right after the Pope left on um, Sunday that I viewed his appearance kind of as a moment of grace that we heard about when we were kids and in, in catechism and uh, many moments really, because there was sort of something for everybody, uh, whether you were bowled over by his laughing with that little baby dressed up in the Pope hat, or you were moved by his talk about uh, climate change or, or uh, respect for life or whatever it was. He seemed to have something for everybody. You know, I'm crazy about this Pope. The, the welcome that we've heard from, from this Pope is different than uh, what we might have at least interpreted uh, previously. I certainly feel as a Catholic welcomed. Um, and I think if I were here today, if today were Sunday, if I were here Sunday or Monday and not Thursday, I think there would really only be uh, 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 two questions um, that I would begin with. One would be there was some concern about how much 
or little he addressed the survivors of the sex abuse crisis, and there was some consternation about his congratulating the courage of the bishops. And there was also the question that, that you just mentioned about the uh, invitation. You know, what, what does this invitation of dialogue mean when he talks about a church with less hostility, uh, with, with more welcome? What does that mean? But I am a newswoman, and since Monday there has been a, um, a development um, which I think for lots of people has been a little disconcerting, so I'm gonna start with that. Uh, I do do a radio program, and what was great to me in the radio is this whole last week, it's been lapsed Catholics saying they were gonna go back and look for a church where they felt welcome to. Sometimes parishes can be a little bit tough. They're gonna to look for different parishes. Non-Catholics saying how inspired they were uh, by this Pope and the talk of, of dialogue and the talk of less hostility. Uh, uh, friends of mine that, that uh, a friend of mine in Holbrook said, you know, our church has been empty, you know, for most Sundays. Well, this past Sunday after the Pope, the place was packed. At my own parish, Jesuit parish, St. Ignatius in Chestnut Hill by Boston College, same thing. Well, St. Ignatius is always packed. Uh, all the good kids from Boston College are always showing up, and it's a great parish, and we have a, I have a great uh, pastor. Um, but there was a real excitement. But today, uh, on the radio, we, we talked for at least a half hour about the Pope's meeting with Kim Davis. And uh, I mean, it's not about uh, being opposed to gay but we um, religious freedom uh, uh, because we understand where he is on that. He talked a lot about that too, but that um, she really was not, when you look at the details of what happened about religious freedom or about being a, a conscientious objector. So there was a lot of sense that this may have tamped down a lot of the good feeling about the Pope. So I hate to start in a down note, but we may as well get the news out of the way <laughs> at the top here. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, our panelists here uh, if we need to hear more from the Vatican uh, about how this happened, because she's a very divisive figure um, in the United States, and it seemed to go against his message of non-divisive uh, dialogue uh, among Catholics and between Catholics and other people of faith in the rest of the world. So anybody want to chime in here at the beginning here about uh, Kim Davis? I should say, by the way, everybody knows she's a Kentucky clerk. People know who she is. She's the Kentucky clerk that did not, uh, would not sign a marriage license for a gay couple and would not allow her assistants to uh, uh, do that since she felt she could not uh, because of her faith. Um, that's what she's doing now, but that's not what she did at the time. Uh, I'll start off on that because um, it's really what struck me too in the Pope's remarks was his talking about how do we overcome the polarization. Exactly. So many of these issues, we just defend territory here and there. And uh, for me, he has been a human being of great skill and dignity to be able to come and initiate these conversations without touching the third rail, without touching that one thing. And to see this one action, uh, I have, uh, I was talking with a friend who's a lapsed Catholic and he expressed exactly what you said. He said, oh, I was thinking this is really good, but since he met with Kim, it's, <laughs> it's all off. And I think that speaks to how difficult it is to talk about these issues and how do we come forward genuinely without polarizing. And so to see how delicate it is, I was just struck by that. Anybody else on Kim Davis? Sarah? Should I guess I, I just, my, my thought when I heard about it was first, please let this be a joke, and it sounds like it wasn't. And, and then the other was like, well, I deserve an audience with the Pope as much as she did. <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> as a person, um, I mean, I've, obviously I don't deserve an audience with the Pope, but just, I don't know, I, I see her as a, I don't know, kind of shameless self-promoter, and I, it was disappointing to see that. Uh, do we know if, if, if in fact, I mean, uh, as of this morning, uh, what I had heard the latest was that we, is it clear that it was planned, it was spontaneous, who was responsible for it, if it actually took place in a kind of planned and premeditated way? I mean, I, 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 it's hard to comment even not, if, not knowing if he in fact well, wanted I, that to happen. I do have some breaking news on this front. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael Sean Winter, he is a blogger for the uh, 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 
National Catholic Reporter. And also, Charlie Pierce, I don't know if he went to Holy Cross. He writes for Esquire, but he grew up around here. Uh, both of them wrote pieces today saying that uh, this may have been, that Pope Francis may have not been 100% clear on Kim Davis' role, that this was arranged by someone at the Vatican. As you know, it was kind of secretly done. Um, uh, she came to, to the, uh, where he was staying and uh, was ushered in, spoke with him for just a couple of minutes, and there was some speculation both by this uh, Michael Sean Winter and by Charlie Pearson Esquire, and this is based on uh, uh, reports by E.J. Dion, who writes for the Washington Post, and he also writes for Commonweal Magazine, he's a great reporter. Um, Catholic, he's from my hometown, actually, in Fall River, uh, and said that uh, this may have been arranged by the Vatican, mm -hmm. and it's not clear how much Pope Francis knew about the details of her case, viewed her as someone who was standing up for religious freedom. He's, of course, very big on religious freedom. He went to see the little Sisters of the Poor, so that maybe he doesn't uh, he was, they almost implied that he was a little bit duped. I don't know if that's true. The Vatican isn't commenting. Um, uh, well, then, then the interesting point would be if, in fact, from his perspective, he was meeting simply with someone who, from his point of view, was someone who worked in government, but because of her religious beliefs, would not uh, sign off on these marriage licenses. If that changes, I mean, let's say taking aside whatever negative Tra uh, personal traits this woman Kim Davis has, which by the way I don't know that much about, but if he believed that this person was, as a matter of principle, objecting to doing this based upon their faith, would that have an effect on the opinion of Pope Francis that some people seem to have? In other words, how much hinges on that? Because I can imagine other cases where someone working in government uh, would, as a conscientious objector, uh, oppose a certain policy, and I think many of the same people would perhaps support that person. If they, if they were to go. So I think it depends on are we being fair and are we applying the standard of, uh, to, to Pope Francis in this case, of being a conscientious, conscientious objector or, you know, sim you know, the similar kinds of dynamics that also take place with the First Amendment. You know, I mean, you believe in it only, if you only believe in it if it's, it kind of goes in your favor, then you don't believe in it. But, but if you can support a conscientious objector even if they're sort of personally vile to you, that is also something to kind of keep in mind. We shouldn't be hypocrites about it. And if Pope Francis is supporting something he takes as being um, a stand for something positive, why should that be a point of criticism or disappointment? I mean, that's just a kind of a question that comes to mind for me. Right. Mm -hmm. I think as a, as a newswoman, I, I think it makes sense to lead with that. But I think there were so many other opportunities where he really dialogued and where he opened up. And times when I thought he was going down some old path and then he just shocked, he just went in other directions and um, you know, went beyond. And so I think those stand out a lot more for me than, than that moment. So you guys down there, you're gonna give, you're gonna pass over this Kim Davis, is it okay <laughs> with you or does anybody wanna weigh in here? I could say something. I think what, what kind of disappointed me was just the sort of clandestine way in which it all happened. Mm -hmm. You know, no one's really sure what happened. Um, but at the same time, I kind of hope that this that this situation doesn't overpower all you know his really the the beautiful message that he had when he was here, um, and really his mission of like social justice and peace. That is something that's not new in the Catholic Church, but the attention that has been brought to this. I hope that is kind of like what is remembered from this trip, and not and not that. I would say, I mean, first of all, I think you're exactly right, Janaire, that we need to know exactly what, what happened. My, my sense is that it's, it's not something that really is, is as big a deal as we might make of it. I was struck by the, uh, when uh, he went to Bolivia and Evo Morales gave him uh, the, the crucifix with the hammer and sickle on it, and there's this great picture of him acting kind of shocked as if, and maybe it's the, the angle of the picture. That's my sense of, of what that moment might very well have been. But, but just uh, um, to, 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 to talk about the, the issue, um, there is, uh, I mean, She's a controversial figure. Um, she's a shameless self-promoter. I think that's that's <laughs> clear. Um, but but that's what dialogue is, right? And, and I, I think if we're if we're praising dialogue, we have to say he should talk to her uh, as well as to to the little sisters of the poor and to, to everybody else. Um, she's um, 
she's not a powerful person. Uh, she's a, what, county clerk uh, in Kentucky. Um, and she's got a lot of attention. I, I don't imagine that's gonna get her very far in life. Uh, and there is a theme in, um, there's a theme in his remarks, especially when he talks about family and the sort of changing notions of family. And he's recognizing a struggle uh, that, that is going on. And I think, I think there's a struggle within congregations um, that, that calls out a dialogue, not a, 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 a one-way discussion about uh, what the, the position should be, but a dialogue between people who are struggling even within congregations that might otherwise look very homogeneous, and I, I certainly I don't. It doesn't appear that she's struggling with the the right or wrong question of it. But she is the kind of person who I think is struggling with this issue that he highlighted uh, in Congress and that he highlighted at the at the the meeting, um, the World Meeting on Families, um, about how we're going to deal with with changing notions of the family. And I think to to really struggle with that, you have to talk to people like her as well as to people who who disagree with her. Well, let's follow up on that then. The whole idea of, of, of dialogue and the whole idea of, of being less divisive and less hostile, he, he, that was a, a theme he, he said over and over again when he was speaking before Congress, really he said it all week long. So what does that mean in terms of, uh, you know, even among Catholics, we're very divided on certain issues. And, and you know, one of the fascinating things about working for the Globe's website, Crux, is that uh, you write something and uh, you know, it's like red state, blue state. You know, it, it, among Catholics, we're, we're just as we're just as mad at each other. The liberals and conservatives are just as mad at each other on a Catholic website, when we're all supposedly Catholics, as we are. Like if we're just in, in a town hall fighting about some divisive issue in town, or if it's national politics. So, what is what can his invitation to this dialogue mean for American Catholics? For me, the beautiful kind of part about Pope Francis's message is that, you know, it's not just a message, he's not just addressing Catholic issues or Catholic struggles, but rather like human struggles, human issues. Um, and I think for him, that's, that's a huge focus, you know, really calling us to the invitation to, to kind of like recognize our shared humanity. And for me, um, I feel that like my time in El Salvador and my time just living amongst the poor, like I think that it is what he's calling us to do precisely, is to get to know the poor, put a face to these statistics. Um, and I feel that in doing that, um, in doing that we feel a responsibility for them. Um, and he talks about time and time again, like the shared responsibility we have for each other and for the earth. Um, and for me, that's kind of like, that's the least divisive thing um, he, he could say. And I think that's what's bringing a lot of Catholics together. And that's, that's so beautiful to see happening. So how does that transfer into action? How do you guys see that happening in, in terms of action? Those of us who are not going to go to El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> well, just before the action piece, I, in the dialogue, I appreciated that that he broadened the kind of the issues that we were thinking. He pushed through those, what, what you called beyond the pelvic issues. <laughs> and he looked at a broader uh, range that I think was uh, eye-opening for a lot of American Catholics about issues, because we've hit on these narrow issues, but he really put the whole palette out there. The arms I just capital punishment, so many out there, I thought, there's some action in that, in the sense of understanding and clarifying where where we sit on a range of concerns. I really um, appreciate how he, he used the phrase like, taking care of our common home a bunch of times. Speaking as a director of environmental studies, I was paying attention to what he was saying about the environment in particular, and he really, I mean, I think he kind of missed an opportunity to hammer it home during his address to Congress, but in his other speeches, um, he really, um, emphasize this idea that our environment is our common home and that there aren't distinctions between Catholics and non-Catholics in caring for the environment and taking um, care of the earth. Um, I feel like he, those of you, probably everybody here knows this, he recently came out with an encyclical, Laudato Si, talking about care of our common home and was a very strident, powerful um, discussion of how we should be doing a better job uh, with the environment. And, 
Um, I don't know, I feel like he, he could have talked to Congress more about that, but the message where, where I was going with that is just, that's a message for everybody, and not just Americans, not just Catholics, not just one group of people, but all of us. Well, he also did say in Congress twice that climate change was caused by human beings, and that is a controversial issue. Um, Only in Congress. <laughs> 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 but, you know, Congress does have a lot of power. Well, yes, <laughs> it's unfortunate. So, no, okay, <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. does, that, does that, how does yeah. that factor in? Well, I mean, so in his encyclical, his encyclical is extremely strongly stating that climate change is real, it is urgent, it is a crisis, it is caused by humans, we should and must do something about it. Um, actually, I, I, I didn't watch his thing live because I was teaching class, but I wrote down at least the part of the transcript it's pretty weak in, in his address to Congress. You know, I call for a courageous and responsible effort to redirect our steps and to avert the most serious effects of the environmental de deterioration caused by human activity. Okay, he does cite human activity. I'm convinced that we can make a difference and I have no doubt that the United States and this Congress have an important role to play. Um, that's all true and that's nice, but when you compare it to the much, much stronger language he's used elsewhere that we're, um, you know, that we're pushing stuff off on our children that we shouldn't anymore, that this is a crisis, that he, he just, this is very mild. And I wish that he had put that out to Congress in a more strident way because that is where um, there's this real disconnect between the established scientific facts of the matter and this perception that climate change either isn't happening or we didn't do it or so what, we can't do anything about it. Okay, Sarah, I want one of the more stridency before Congress. I did, <laughs> absolutely. Anybody else? Yep. I mean, you could argue the opposite, I guess, that maybe his he shouldn't have, Maybe he shouldn't have mentioned it at all, but you know, congressmen will say, well, he's not a scientist, but he was he a was scientist. A, yeah. But, but I think the, the issue I see is how do we go beyond a kind of moral relativism? Well, yeah, whatever you believe is fine, and still be in dialogue. And, and I thought he is so sensitive to the audience so if you read there, you can sort of see he wasn't backing down, but he wasn't leading with that. Uh, and I was conscious as he made his remarks about family and the changing things, you could read many things into that. And uh, what I am a, a Zen Buddhist priest, so not uh, from the Catholic tradition, but I'm pretty sure I could tell you what his position on family would be but he ended his little remarks on family not with it must be between a man and woman, it must be sanctified by the church, but family is precious and rich and beautiful. And I thought, well, that's a different place to go. It's still saying the family's important, but not saying let's lead with my position, but let's lead with what is important here. And I thought that's quite something, and another point he talks about, to sacrifice particular interest to serve the common good. And all of us have our hobby horses that we ride. You know, it must, if you don't do this, here's my litmus test. And I think it's a call to engagement uh, that is very difficult, and I think we've really lost our way as a democracy in terms of how to engage in this way, and he's, uh, modeling it, I think not just for Catholics, but uh, for everyone. And then I, I think he got uh, blunt on the arms race. Right, there were, he, just had, he talked about many things. In just yeah. a sentence, and, and he goes through the whole range of life, and you know, you know what's coming when he's talking about life and how that goes, and then he brings up capital punishment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so I thought in other areas. He was very direct, okay. yeah. I was struck by the, the, the metaphors he used about family and home and the sort of mundane concerns of life, um, the daily bread, uh, the, the little niceties that make home a special place. Warm meals and Yeah, hugs. the little meal, yeah. the meals and, and, uh, and saving money. I, I just thought that was, uh, that was really wonderful language. And, and, and what, it, what it struck me is that those are places where we don't get too strident with each other, maybe. Uh, those are places where we, 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 be, we try to behave civilly with one another. And I think there was a, there was a bit of what he was trying to do uh, that was about 
calling us to things that we can agree on, right? Mm -hmm. To get us to sort of reset us. And I think going back to the, you know, the family as the as the core of the story of redemption, I think there's something really, really beautiful about that. And so to have conversations, to have experiences, to think about how we experience uh, uh, engagement with the poor from this very personal relationship, this very personal uh, kind of um, communal space, I, I think that's a great uh, model for what real dialogue could be. If we could, if we could, instead of yelling at each other and standing up or sitting down, depending on which we, what we agree with, um, I think that's the kind of place where Americans, and I, I think as a political scientist, I think that um, first of all, that gets Catholics kind of more in a place where he, he, um, they agree with him rather than where they might disagree with him. But also to get Americans to a place where where we agree rather than places where we don't agree. And that's kind of a, ge a general statement. But. You know, as somebody who's, I've done a fair amount of uh, interfaith uh, dialogue and this kind of work, and the one thing that I've found to be the case is that um, without a concern for the truth, the moral dimensions of things tend to be very superficial and they don't really penetrate and not a lot gets done. And the most successful um, dialogues, if you like, are those which actually have a very strong concern for actually fundamental questions of what is true. And this, I think, is perhaps the one, I, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed by it, because when you read the full writings of, of Pope Francis on, on various questions, he really does have a very strong sense of, obviously, Catholic teachings and the nature. But when I say the truth, I'm talking about questions like, what, what's the Catholic answer to what is a human being? I mean, just very basic questions. What is a human being? What is the world? Because you can't talk about what, you're supp what you should do if you don't know what reality is like in the first place. So the one, in a, in, in a sense, one of the purposes of the church and one of the purposes, especially of the Catholic Church historically, is not only to p tell people what they should be doing, but also giving a picture of what reality is like, such that what they're being asked to do actually makes sense. And so when you tell, um, and you, when you make a speech to people, but you're in a sense not challenging from the Catholic point of view or from the traditional religious point of view, the essential philosophy of the world, the way that you think of, the, uh, of what the cosmos is as a kind of, I mean, if, if, if you're addressing an audience that thinks that the, the cosmos is a giant machine, uh, and that there's no blessing or grace or any, there's no room for anything. Like, and then you say, well, as a Catholic, I say that you should do this. There's going to be a disconnect between, well, I, I should do this, but really deep down, I don't understand how that really makes any sense. And of course, Catholicism and a traditional religion has these rich, rich resources for, in a sense, helping people to make sense out of why. What, what is the truth of things? That element is present in, Saint Fran in Pope Francis's writings. So for example, he this incredible statement, he, quoting from John Chrysostom, where he says, uh, when, the when, the, when you withhold your wealth from the poor, you are stealing from them. That, that's a statement not of what you should do, but that's saying this is what reality is like. Christ is actually in those people. It's not a sentimental feeling. God is actually there and you're stealing from him. These kinds of things need to be laid down, I would say, by religious leaders. Otherwise, the dialogue is just a lot of sentimentality. I mean, if you're going to have, again, my experience, I know I'm, I'll just end with this. When you say, look, I believe this is what the reality is like. This is the truth. You believe the truth is something else. That can then be the basis for dialogue, not just what should we do, and let's assume that we all think reality is the same thing. Again, especially when you're talking about someone of the stature, the intellectual stature of the pope. Well, you know, speaking of, uh, of that, you know, I wonder what people think about his, his talk about income inequality, which is becoming more of a political issue in, in the United States. And, you know, it, it's, it's something, I don't know about everybody else's uh, church, um, but mostly, you know, the, the sermon is off the, the, the gospel and the readings, and a lot of times people don't like it if priests get into politics and all that kind of thing. Um, but then you have, income inequality, which is essentially about the poor, and you wonder whether the Pope's emphasis on this in, in, in Congress this week in, in Philadelphia and New York as well, whether this translates into us hearing about this more from the pulpit. Uh, you know, if, if because of it's not being just about a, a political position, but about treatment of the least among us, are we going to start hearing about this? I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that was his message that there usually we say, well, religion is here and politics are here. 
and I think one of the things he's calling us all as religious people to say we live in this context, we live in this world where the suffering and inequality is staggering. Uh, and to think that somehow we can work for our own salvation without including everyone, uh, I think is becoming a less and less tenable position. But we don't hear about this, at least we don't, it's not been my experience, you know, I don't want to get anyone upset, but it seems like the Protestants are much better at attacking the news of the week <laughs> and Sundays. And, and the Catholics, it's a lot of times the readings, and sometimes you want them to talk about something that's really monumental that just happened. And, and it can be, even in my wonderful Jesuit parish, and I love it, um, um, they don't because it's perceived to be political. And a lot of people joke that part of the reason that hasn't happened is because um, uh, some people think that the bishops, have, have, because of the social issues, have moved far to the right, and the income inequality talk is not mostly coming from the right. Mm -hmm. So does this transfer into something in our parishes that we're going to hear about? Frank, you've been on the edge of this <laughs> for uh, several decades. Uh, well, uh, I mean, certainly it translates into, you know, uh, the, the reality of it, whether it actually gets up in the pulpit, I'm, that's what's kind of why I'm backing off. I, I, I'm not sure, uh, maybe it's a concern I have a little bit that um, for clergy, for Catholic clergy as uh, celibate men, it's, I don't think they spend a lot of time thinking about uh, unemployment um, or the threat of losing their job or, or uh, homelessness. Certainly, they have those pastoral concerns, and I think they care about them, but to move those pastoral concerns to a, a social, I think that's a challenge. And, and so what their lived experience is, and then the pastoral, there's some disconnects that I think make it difficult. Should we be doing this, or maybe not? It seemed to me that's what Pope Francis was, was urging upon us, but maybe I'm mistaken. I really think that kind of everything Pope Francis is saying, it's like, it's nothing new really to our faith and to most faiths, um, but I think he's just sort of bringing us down to our roots in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, what it's really about, caring for the poor, forgiveness, like that's what it's all about. So I think, even though some, a lot of what he says can be taken as political, maybe, um, I really hope that parishes um, discuss these, you know, and, and their homilies bring up these issues because they're so not political. Like I said before, like they're human issues. Um, and for me as a Catholic, that's really what I feel like our faith is all about, um, kind of those things he's talking about. And I think for it's really the truth in a lot of faiths. Um, I'm a Protestant, so I, I get my, my, I get my, uh, okay. my public affairs in the in. sermon. I didn't know they let you in. They let you at the door. Yeah, well, I snuck in as a political scientist. Okay. And I'll make a political political kind of point, but I, I, think, I think that's part of what, what's interesting about this pope choosing to speak to Congress, which is to say he's choosing to speak to the American people. Um, I, 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 think he, I think it's a recognition that, um, for, first of all, to talk to Catholics is, is very different today than, than maybe 50 or 100 years ago uh, when Catholics were much more of a, of a unified group, uh, when to say Catholic was to say Democrat uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, this, this, to speak to, 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 the Amer to Americans, I felt like it was a, an effort to speak to American religious people, right, uh, in a particular way, and to find common ground uh, between religious people who maybe, not, maybe don't all recognize his leadership, but who, um, but who share common values. And I, I, I think, I, I, I hate to keep going on about the struggles within the church, but I, I do think that there is a struggle at the congregational level, I mean, at the level where the pastors, priests, um, ministers have a, a certain position that isn't necessarily what the members of the, of the congregation think. And I think there's a lot more certainty in the pulpit than there is in, in the pew. Uh, and I think that on, on issues like income inequality as well as the, 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 the other issues, um, the, the mm -hmm. cultural issues, I'm trying not to say
say the pelvic issue, but that's all I can think of. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's, there's division, there's, there's uncertainty about those, and I think he's creating, trying to create a kind of cultural space where it's okay to have those kinds of conversations amongst ourselves, even if that's not the conversation that we might be hearing from the pulpit, but that's, maybe that's a political perspective. Oh, go ahead. So, so I want to say that I think that this issue is an issue of American faith, not just of Catholicism. I've worked closely with a number of Protestant denominations uh, whose uh, attendance is declining year after year after year, and this institution of church as it has been created in our society no longer seems to be functioning in the way it did 50 years ago. Uh, and so I think there is a call and a necessity that I hear in almost every denomination, how do we become relevant? Mm -hmm. How do we become the center of people's lives in ways, n not just in, in Catholicism, but in the, the Anglican movement and the other Protestant movements, and, and in Buddhism? You know, so now in Zen Buddhism, uh, a tradition of meditation and uh, inward looking, how do we recognize the strains of our tradition in this same way? And how do we not become politically, uh, you must this and that, but encourage engagement in the world in some personal way, like Emily was saying? I must say, it was interesting to me, Zen Buddhism and Buddhism in general are you know, very hip. You know, it's yeah. very cool. Uh, well, thank you, go to the, thank you, Emily. You go to, you go to the, <laughs> it's a great story. Uh, people know uh, Thomas Keating. He's the Centering Prayer guy. He used to be up in, yeah. uh, in Western Massachusetts. He tells a great story about how back in the mid-70s, you know, the people would keep ringing in the doorbell, and they'd all be like 20 and 21. They'd be in their jeans. And he was so excited to see them, thinking they were coming to the Spencer uh, Monastery. But no, they weren't. They were going to look for the Buddhist center that was down the road. <laughs> right. So he kept Embarrassed. thinking, what are, we, what are we missing that the Buddhists are all getting? They're not coming to us. But it was interesting to me that for a, a, at least last week, it suddenly became pretty hip to be Catholic. Yeah. You know? We saw people on yeah. TV saying, yeah. well, I'm a Catholic. Well, I'm right. baptizing my kid. Right. I, you know, I'm a lapsed Catholic, but I'm going back to church. Chris Cuomo on CNN, I wrote this in Crux. He announced that he was at St. Ignatius in, in New York, Every, the Catholics were all like, you know, kind of hip and trendy for at least, <laughs> at least a week. At least a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about that, though. I mean, we have been losing uh, uh, people uh, in, in parishes. Um, so many parishes are empty and they're closing and they're being consolidated. So what about the Pope in, in terms of that? Um, people are very attracted to him and he's very appealing. and. And you look at him, um, if people have read his book, Joy of the Gospel, I mean, he really makes this whole enterprise seem really joyful. You know, you, you come with me, uh, man, woman, girl, boy, and you're gonna feel my joy, but is that gonna transfer? Is his papacy and his being here gonna matter in, in parishes in America? I, I think it has already. And I, I think if you talk about what's gonna happen from the pulpit, that's different than what happens in the pews. And I think that we see it already that that energy is out there. And I, I thank the college and uh, the chaplain's office for having this conversation. To I think we have to work at it to carry it on. I think we have to stay on it or it's just a, a news moment. But there are certain structures like uh, community organizing um, is uh, you know the anti-poverty tool of the Catholic Church through a fund called the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. And that fund has struggled for a while, but not anymore. People are, you know, they see that, they get it, and maybe it's just cutting a check or whatever, but it's trying to move into, and it's, it's good, it's, it's uh, an opportunity. As someone, I'm not religious at all. I, I was raised Russian Orthodox and it didn't stick. And um, I think many people have many reasons for leaving a church that they grew up in. And I think um, some reasons might, you know, someone might be convinced by a pope that is being more consistent in a message. So, you know, if you're pro-life, you are pro-life birth to, you know, to, you know, no capital punishment and um, loss of some of the maybe hypocrisy that maybe someone might perceive. Um, but I think also not everybody feels like they need to be religious. And I think um, someone like me, I, I, I'm really impressed with this pope. I love, I, I love his environmental message. Um, I, I am on board with 
the environment and all of these things as social justice issues and moral issues. We have morals too, even if you're not religious. And I think um, doesn't make me want to go to church on Sunday. That's one of the beautiful <laughs> joys of being a grown up is I don't have to go to church anymore on Sunday. But um, but I'm sorry, I shouldn't. I'm thinking fired here. <laughs> um, but I think. I mean, it depends on why, why people are leaving. And, and for some, like maybe that community is not, does not speak to them and they're not gonna come back. And maybe um, for some, a re-energized you know, re leadership, a, re a refocus on helping people, that might bring people back. I don't know. Anybody else? I, I, don't, I don't know about, uh, about how the Catholic Church is gonna respond, but, um, the, church, the churches that are growing the most are these little like storefront uh, churches. If you drive down Chandler Street, uh, or, or, or uh, Chandler Street is the one I'm thinking of, uh, in, in, in Worcester, is if you pass five or six churches that are in, in these little storefronts, and they're, they're Protestant, they're Catholic, they're non-denominational, um, and, and they're, they're thriving, and they're popping up everywhere. Um, and uh, my sense is those are churches that are really meeting people's needs. They're not, they're not um, churches that have been there forever and therefore we have to go to them because you know, that's what we do. Uh, but they're churches where um, they're meeting a need in the community. A lot of immigrant churches um, that, are, that are like that. Um, and that's, that's where you see growth. Um, whether that trans, whether I, I don't know that that one visit by one pope yeah. <laughs> transforms that, um, unless this conversation becomes something that people feel like they need, or this this engagement with the with the poor, with the with the world, it becomes something that people feel like they need. Sarah, do I have time for one more question? Yeah. I just wondered before we uh, open this up for questions, what people make of Pope singling out, as Father said before, Dorothy Day, and uh, and. Uh, and Thomas Merton, Thomas Merton, so famous yeah. for his, yeah. his delving into Buddhism very deeply and his interfaith, uh, advocating for interfaith relationships, which was kind of a no-no back in his day. And, and Dorothy Day, I love the Dorothy Day part because, you know, I've done a few things I shouldn't have done in my day. <laughs> and you know, but I'm nowhere near Dorothy Day. I mean, she had multiple <laughs> lovers, and she had a child out of wedlock, she had an abortion. I mean, she was really swinging for the chandeliers back there in Greenwich <laughs> Village, living the bohemian life. And of course, she then she became a Catholic, and she, you know, Catholic workers' movement and, and, and all that, and she was wonderful. But I thought that was, well, I'm not letting you answer. I'm stealing your answer. <laughs> but let me just say, I thought that was great because, again, it was a welcome back uh, to people. I, I'm divorced, and, um, and it's hard to be divorced, never mind divorced and remarried. Um, in, in the church sometimes, and I love that he chose her because she stepped off the rails multiple times, and yet he singled her out. And as Cardinal Dolan has said, the effort to make her a safe, uh, saint rather, speaks to the Catholic ability to be both and, which I love that quote. So <laughs> I've stolen you guys, but let me, let me, anybody weigh in on Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton? Well, uh, Thomas Merton also was interested in Sufism or Islamic mysticism right. as well. That's and right. I, I was very glad that he used him as an example because I mean, he, he says these things a little bit subtly. He doesn't really, I mean, but he was saying Merton was primarily a man of prayer and contemplation. In other words, uh, and that's an element, I think, of Catholic teaching and the Catholic that somehow d doesn't make it out into, into the public sphere as much as I think it should, which is to say that there is a reality of the spiritual life, the reality of being a person devoted to God that has nothing to do with your social connections. And we've ten we tend to default to the idea that to be religious is to be a really nice person, uh, as opposed to, in a sense, having a true relationship with God, which is really part of all traditional religions, of uh, Catholicism included, and Islam. Uh, it, it's that way, and I think one thing that the church, and only the church for Catholics, can offer is a sense that a person doesn't simply have to be reduced to their relationships with other people in order to be counted as something worthy before God, or to be a good person, and I think a lot of people have adopted, I think unfortunately, and it creates all sorts of negative effects, the idea that you're only doing something worthwhile if it's what you can do can be framed in terms of a charitable endeavor of some kind or another, or politics, or social work, all of which are, of course, absolutely worthy, but it eliminates the, 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 the whole cause of our existence, which is our, our relationship with our creator, according to all religions. 
And so that I was glad that he brought up Merton because if you, you know, Google Merton, maybe some of these things will come up and people will get something out of it. So that was, I thought, very good. Anybody else on Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton? Well, Th Thomas Merton for me, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, going to college in the early 70s, you know, and reading Seven Story Mountain, uh, incredible, I think, cultural figure and his writing and his uh, engagement with Catholicism certainly changed my relationship to Catholicism through him and what he found and, and certainly as a fellow contemplative, you know, and so to have him called out and his capacity to, to speaking of interreligious dialogue, to, to really go beyond the platitudes. So let's not get together and say we should be nice to each other. Yeah. There's really not much energy in that. <laughs> but, but if we get together around some uh, a mystery that we are all a part of and all uh, uh, in this emerging planet that, that we don't actually know what it is to share that awe or that love or something, then, then it's not about political, do you believe X, Y, or Z, but we are human beings together, heart beats, we walk on this fragile green planet, and we can come together. I, I, looked, at, I looked at some other um, uh, heads of states who, who address Congress, and, and Martin Luther King is a favorite uh, for, people, for, for, I think, good, good and, and, and obvious reasons. And, and, uh, and Lincoln is, is, is a safe choice. Um, I, we, we, in America, we, when we refer to these kind of figures, Lincoln, Jefferson, King, Washington, it means something. We, we, we really put a lot of stake in those kind of references. And so I think to, 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 to get people Googling uh, these, uh, these characters, uh, these, these, sorry, these, these individuals is, is important. I think it, it matters. I loved that Pope Francis mentioned Dorothy Day. Um, just kind of as you were saying, Marjorie, she's just such a real, real. She's so real, yeah. and I think everyone can connect to her in some way. Um, and then also just her dedication and her mission of peace and justice. Um, I think especially now, um, you know, at a time where violence, I feel like it's just all we see on you know the front pages of papers and television screens and computers. Um, so I think another just. Pope Francis's call for like peace at this time is especially so important. And the fact that she played, paid such a price for being a pacifist during World War II right. with the Nazis and marching across Europe, that, right. that took incredible, incredible courage. So I guess, we, I guess we see if anybody has any, has any questions um, here from um, the panel. There's a microphone if you step up to that. Oh yeah. I guess you, we're supposed to come to the microphone. See the microphone right there so everyone can hear you? I have a question. Can I make a few statements on what you said? Is that possible? I don't have uh, a specific question. I think questions are better than statements, generally speaking. Yeah, I'm just going by my experience. For me, Pope Francis has lost a little bit of his cachet as we did with uh, Miss Davis. Uh, it's interesting you brought that up. He brought, uh, you, know, I, you know, I liked him a lot more before, obviously because uh, he seemed to be bringing up these universal things. He got involved, and he did go as a rep head of the Vatican State, uh, so I respect that, but he, he got involved as, uh, and to American domestic politics, saying that. As you said, nobody's denying her right as a citizen uh, to believe anything she wants, because church and state is divided, but she didn't do that. So, and I found it interesting when you mentioned about uh, the blog by Mr. Pierce or other people about how the bureaucracy might have slipped into the rim. That shows again part of the problem. We're losing control. Is it the Pope or is it the bureaucracy? So there's many questions that I, uh, statements I'd like to say about that. I'm not a student yet. I found it interesting yeah. that you said in uh, God We Trust in your opening statements. I think the, yesterday or today, the uh, in God We Trust was adopted on American money in the 50s. People don't recognize the 50s, you remember the 50s, but I do. I was born and raised in Worcester and grew up in the 50s and 60s. And when the Catholic Church was extremely powerful, I'm not a Catholic because I was baptized in the Trinity and all my friends were Catholic. And I know what a novena is, I know what a scapula is. Uh, every time I go by, and, uh, I remember what school prayer is. Every time I went on a bus trip with my friends, I'd bottom my head and make believe I was crossing myself. 
I've heard the mass in Latin, but, uh, but I feel uncomfortable yeah. sitting in the back. Nobody else has put up for Eucharist. So I, I understand the old Catholic Church. I don't understand the new Catholic Church. Like this gentleman brought up about the, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church being political. It is. Everybody left, or in the pews, everybody left in the pews in the high court Catholics. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You know, I don't mean to be rude, but you're giving a speech. If you have a if you have a question, yeah, I'm just going to forget that right now. Okay, then get to, get yeah. to it, please. To me, he's opened up that question of church and state. Yeah. And secondly, he hasn't addressed the question of uh, abortion and, he, and population. He can be green as he wants. But he okay. He identifies the population question, and that's not going to be solved. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sorry. Thank you. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Anybody have a response? But I had a, a friend, I, this friend I was talking to today pointed out this population thing and how can you be consistently say you're for the planet if you don't address population. So I said, so you think he's not perfectly consistent? A and I said, w that may be so, but I hope that I'm not held to that standard. Uh, of course, I think no one person is going to be perfectly coherent and have positions that totally uh, that totally jibe. So, h how do we focus on the the invitation rather than what the the difference is? Uh, somebody uh, along those lines, um, somebody once said to me, and I stole it, and I've used it many times, that uh, you know I'm going to about when they were asked why they were a Catholic, and because of different positions the church took, and they said, well, I'm an American, and I disagree with the American uh, with, with my government on this, 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 and this. And due respect, they didn't go off and become a Canadian because they were upset with with what the government said. So I think that's who gets elected next round. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. A lot of people are going to go to Canada. Remember that when, when George right. Bush was? I think yeah. uh, who was the guy? Alec Baldwin, and the, I think he's still married to Kim Basinger. He was going to go to Canada, but he ended up not going to Canada. Yeah. Now he's married yeah. to his yoga teacher, and he's in New York City. But anyway, <laughs> anybody else, or is or is that it? Does anybody else have a question? I would just ask if uh, any on the panel watch carefully the UN speech um, and thought about its relationship to the speeches to the American Congress, the American people, and then the speeches to the Catholic people later that both in some way fit into, I thought for him, the UN speech, which is about the whole shooting match. Anybody? Yeah, I really like the UN speech, actually. I mean, he uh, he laid out clearly, you know, why you should support the international system. I mean, he he made what I think could only be a reference to basically the United States and the UK and you know a couple of other European countries about the the idea of either you know you have to use the international system as an actual system and not just as something like you you use for yourself once in a while when it's you know to your benefit and then you ignore for the rest of you know your relations. Uh, it would, you know, of course you can all say, why don't he just call out specific countries? But I mean, I think he made a very clear point that, you know, which is good because, you know, especially in the United States, the UN, it's somehow mm. fashionable in a lot of sectors to bash the UN for some reason, as if they're a bunch of nefarious characters bent on world domination or something like that, as opposed to a very sensible reaction to the horrors of the, you know, the 20th century. So I thought, I thought it was great, you know, I, th I thought it was, and, and I wish he would have even been more strong, you know, but it was good. Sarah, did you think he was better? In Absolutely, yeah. yeah. He, he um, had a lot more, I mean, just in terms of length, um, he had a lot more to say about the environment with the UN, and his language there was much stronger. He talked about um, it is the poor who suffer the most from climate change. He talked about the world is not ours to misuse or abuse. Um, he, that's, that's the kind of language he used there, as opposed to the much more neutral language he used in, the, in Congress. And the refugees. Right. And yeah. That was a big. That we didn't even get to yep. that. But the refugees was obviously a big theme of him. Yep. Of his throughout the week, particularly in the UN. I kind of thought, and for Congress, if it just comes up, he should have. If if I can say this, you know, that because the question of religion and politics comes up, 
I think somehow he should object. I mean, I know it's maybe not very diplomatic. He should somehow object to the idea that, you, listen, you love me when I agree with your policies and you invoke <laughs> religion all the time. I'm thinking of certain politicians in this country. But the minute I diverge from your policy, suddenly I'm just a moral leader or I'm just a this or I'm just a that. There's quite a lot of, I mean, really rank cynical hypocrisy just around Catholicism. By, by politicians who, you know, they, they think it's an a la carte deal. I can just quote the Pope when I, when I need to, and otherwise he's, well, he's just a, he's just a human being after all. And, you know, and he, you know these you know, politicians who, who give out Ayn Rand novels as required reading to their staff and then call themselves <laughs> Catholics. I mean, I don't understand this, you know. <laughs> and so I, I think on some of these issues, I think I would even say, why can't the Pope be more divisive? Why can't he, I, I mean, why is he dialogue? Don't dialogue with these people. Tell them what the truth is and then just leave them off. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I have a comment that's related to that. I, I think people can hear me. I mean, one of the titles that, that's often used for the Pope is Pontiff, Pontifex Bridge Builder. So how does he actually do that? Can the more abrasive, divisive call to conversion or sort of this is right, this is wrong, can he do that and be a bridge builder? Or does the bridge building tend to compromise that in some way? It's a great question. Yeah, I think that's the one of the real political questions of our time. And we certainly see some elements of both political parties that think the way to go is to become more and more pure. If I am pure and do not compromise, that is the most responsible thing to do. And it seems to me that kind of love of purity and challenge, I'm going to tell you what the truth is and you're either for or against, that is a, a bifurcated world of saints and sinners that he spoke against. So how do we uh, come forward with some kind of truth? Because you point to the, how easily it slips into moral relativism. Right? If everything's okay, and then it's nice. So, so I think that's the real, in Zen we say that's the koan. That's that problem that how can we embody authentic dialogue that's principled and still uh, realize that if we do not relate to each other, if we do not have bridges to people very different from us, we are in trouble. But, but there's also the other side of that, which is, and again, I'm bringing up my experience as a doing you know, Muslim-Christian dialogue, which is that the most successful dialogues were the ones, like for example, the Common Word Initiative, where it began on the premise, look, this is what we believe. It's completely different from what you believe. You are never going to become a Muslim, and we are never going to become a Christian. So let's just begin with that. We're not asking you to denature your beliefs, and you're not going to let us denature our beliefs. Now let's talk about what we can do. That, that doesn't have to be, in other words, there's not an opposition between telling the truth and then building bridges with, with people. It, it, it's when people try to um, um, be sort of overly sentimental and uh, let, you know, a lot of hand, good natured and good, well intentioned hand holding. But that doesn't have any lasting effect. It's sort of, right, you know, as soon as you leave the meeting, it all disappears. You know, and those initiatives which actually had a kind of a lasting echo and an effect where people actually sort of spontaneously were precisely the initiatives that said, look, this is the truth. This is what we think the truth. And there's a way of doing that that's not obnoxious. I mean, I think what we object to is not when somebody says, this is what I think is the truth. And I believe that the, the, the following moral obligations follow from that truth. It's when people are abrasive, obnoxious, and supremacist in that. And they, in, they're insisting that other people, I mean, I don't think telling the truth should be always considered to be the, the cutting off of a bridge. You know, I, I think there's a way to do it. I, I also think, though, and maybe where I began is where we'll end, but it was a literary form. He's coming to the United States speaking for the first time in Congress as a religious leader. No one has done this before. Yeah. He's got 25 minutes to do something. He's giving multiple other speeches in the same week. Right. He doesn't have the protracted experience of I'm going to the same group over time where we right. get to evolve things. I, I think sometimes we expect too much. And the, the advantage we have, and I'm kind of waiting for the public speeches as a whole to see mm -hmm. how dramatically in his, his, his encyclical just got huge play in the press. So rather than revamp all of that, I can see why he's trying to, to the Congress, he was trying to touch on a whole variety of issues to a house that's highly divided where people aren't speaking to each other. So dialogue makes 
that's probably the progressive next step for that group to do what you did or could do in another environment. I don't think would have worked, and mm -hmm. I would have been probably rude and mm -hmm. probably would have been turned people off. He is a very nuanced person. I thought it was so sophisticated in terms of what he invited us to, without provoking a lot of antagonism, because he he's never been there here before, first time visitor. He's never even been in the United States before. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it was a very sophisticated approach for what it could do. There are many other things I think he tried to do in the course of a week, and some he didn't probably do as much of because he just issued an encyclical and other things. So I think if you look at this speech in the totality of the six days he was here, and then in the backdrop drop of an encyclical and of his other statements of the Catholic Church that are well known, I think what he was trying to do becomes I think, more interesting and how he does it becomes extremely interesting as a conveyor of his truth. So I, I just think we need to be a bit sophisticated about how we analyze what he was attempting. Well, and I think, um, but I think he set the foundation. If you look at the first few paragraphs, it's, it lays out all the principles of Catholic social teaching, dignity of the person, life and community, solidarity, option for the poor. He, he lists them out, in, but in a prose way, but I thought set the foundation where I think there is a, a lot of agreement on those principles and <clears throat> kind of then says, where do, how do we take action mm -hmm. from this foundation? This part. Well, it's five minutes past five, so I think we have to wrap it up here. <laughs> thank you. I just want to thank our panelists and Marjorie. You just did a, a fabulous job of really uh, illuminating the speech and, and also giving us a lot to think about. And I hope this invitation to dialogue can continue in the weeks and months ahead. We're lucky to be a community that's here together for an extended period of time and so be able to develop this further as it goes along. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.